Uh, thank you, Benny, uh, for inviting me to this uh, wonderful conference uh, and also putting me at a very difficult uh, position. The first reason is that there's lunch after my discussion and we're already late. And the second one is that Benny told me to make constructive comments, but then I realized that in Israel, constructive comments is let's deconstruct the paper and then tell you how to reconstruct it. So I'm going to do it. Uh, so it's going to be really easy, constructive comments um, uh, in, the, in the most uh, uh, benign way. Uh, the paper is very interesting. Um, and you know, I'm not really coming from the mutual fund um, I have done work on mutual funds, so I also learned a lot uh, about that. Um, so briefly, let's talk a little bit about uh, what is the paper about. So um, in March of 2016, Morningstar fir first published sustainability ratings where more than 20,000 mutual funds were ranked on a percentile basis and given a globe rating based on their holdings. Uh, the worst 10% of the funds were rated one globe, low sustainability, while the best 10% were rated five globes, high sustainability. Prior to the publication, there was not an easy way for investors to judge the sustainability of, the most, of most mutual funds without considerable effort. So this is an interesting um, laboratory to examine the effect of this new disclosure on uh, mutual funds and on flows of funds, etc. So. Um, the big question is sort of what do funds uh, value? Is this the star rating that they value? Is this the performance or the globe rating, uh, the sustainability rating? I then figured out that actually globe is one type of a star, so it should be <laughs> all stars, but uh, they basically, um, uh, this is basically the, the, the fundamental question. And, and, and I believe that the answer is not a trivial uh, answer. It's, it's probably very complicated relation. Um, Maria Sunta talked about lexicographic. Uh, relations about you know how exactly uh, these are being valued, uh, but I think this is a very interesting question to ask. Uh, I start with the um, seminal paper by Hartzmark and Sussman in JF of 2019, where they, at least to me, was quite convincingly showing that this Morningstar Globe rating had a strong influence on uh, fund flows. Uh, and what really happened here, what you see is basically uh, the blue line is the flow to the good funds, the globe, high globe rating funds, and the red is the low uh, globe rating funds. So we see, and it's quite striking, you know, March of 2016, it was introduced, and we see a divergence, basically increase in flow for the, um, for the um, high globe and uh, decreasing flow to the low globe. So what this paper is doing is sort of tries to, in a way, pour some cold water on this result and say, look, you looked at the earlier period, uh, which is basically uh, March of 2016 to December of 2016. What I'd like to do is to expand this and also to contrast this with ha what happened in the later period. Do we indeed see something different there than what we saw in the earlier period? And then the interpretation is actually, you know, I think the, the most challenging, challenging thing is really to understand why we see those differences. Um, so. Um, you know, why this question important, and you know, I hear a quote, um, Hartman and Sussman, you know, um, they basically say, look, you know, we don't really know why we make investments in, um, in uh, sustainable companies. Some investors will believe that an increase in resources directed towards sustainability is costly, and, uh, and basically the primary goal is maximizing profit, so we might have some of those funds thinking about this, think about it this way. Others will believe that um, a well-run company should care about the environment and companies should act uh, to restore um, beyond uh, simple uh, value maximization. These will be sort of the funds that are sustainable funds. Uh, others would still um, value um, the uh, investment not because they uh, value um, such investment, not because they inherently care about the environment, but because they um, think that there's going to be a relation between um, this in, in profits, and some investors will be unaware that the firm is investing uh, in sustainability at all. Uh, well, surely the market contains examples of each of those investors. It remains unclear which type of investors, on average, um, affect um, are, are in this market, and it is unclear whether uh, investment sustainability are consistent 
with what investors want. So I think this is sort of tries to shed more light on sort of this uh, bigger question. Um, so the question is basically, do mutual funds value sustainability uh, in light of the earlier findings of Hartmark and Sussman? So we, we see, you know, the, just taking that face value, we see an increase in flow to funds with high sustainability. You know, do they still hold it? And if not, why not? Okay. Um, and the argument, uh, sort of the, the hypothesis is that, well, it's probably not. I don't expect them to actually do that. Why? Because mutual fund managers are paid based on performance rather than sustainability rating. Uh, and therefore, you know, going hand in hand also with previous work, uh, uh, you know, in other dimensions, you know, about the CEOs and, and compensation and incentives, um, you know, they should really care about performance. Uh, mutual funds should therefore value sustainability to the extent that it enhances uh, performance, it has it returns. And the implication is that the disclosed ranking uh, that caused buying pressure uh, of mutual funds, as a result, we should expect an increase in stock price of the sustainable firms, reducing their attractiveness in achieving high return in the future. We should therefore expect less pressure from funds to buy them in order to uh, improve their fund rating. Okay, so this is, uh, and I, I realize that's sort of a new version of the paper, but this is sort of in the original uh, framework that was sort of the um, the, the framework of the hypothesis. So just to summarize uh, briefly the findings, basically contrasting um, the March 16 to December 16 with the March 17 to uh, September 17. So before we had these border funds, funds that were sort of just, you know, uh, you know, below sort of, you know, one ranking of one star, one globe going to two globes, we see that indeed they try to improve their uh, globe rating. Uh, we don't see it afterwards. Uh, we see abnormal trading in sustainable firms uh, for funds that improve their global rating. We don't see any abnormal trading uh, afterwards. Uh, buying stocks we, with ab abnormal ESG trading and shorting stocks with abnormal um, ESG trading bigger than zero and smaller than zero leads to positive alpha. We see that in the beginning. We don't see it um, afterwards. Um, uh, Funds that are closer to the star rating cutoffs uh, take larger position in stock negative aggregate ESG trading pressure. We don't see it afterwards. And basically, the entire conclusion is that uh, nothing happens afterwards. Um, so I think this is a, a, a well-written, well-executed uh, paper. In the beginning, I was like thinking about all kinds of quibbles regarding, you know, do you measure it correctly? You know, are we really dealing with the same... Uh, companies or the same funds before and after, but they do a really good job in in the robustness test. They, you know, they in the you know you can think about the globe rating uh, of Morningstar being a relative rating. So every time they basically look at everybody and say, okay, you are the first, you are the second, you are the third. So it's sort of you know it's, it's like a rat race, right? Everybody could be really investing in in good firms, but uh, but because you know we raise the the bar and, and everything is is relative, then you know you basically don't have any. Um, uh, um, you know, you're considered a bad firm. So at some point you might say, well, you know, I don't care about this anymore because there's nothing for me to do it, uh, about it. Uh, but then they also look at other ratings which are, uh, which are uh, you know, less fluctuating and they find the same results. You know, another argument, you know, um, that Mario Sunta mentioned, issues related to, um, to, you know, in the beginning you basically have some sorting, first sorting into those who like good funds, those who like bad funds, and then after that we shouldn't expect anything. But then they show that indeed there's actually large movements uh, in the ranking of funds uh, even afterwards, and so you know it is uh, it is indeed um, you know um, showing some tests that it's not really coming from that. So uh, my main comments are the positioning of the paper in light of the literature on investor ESG preferences. Some of it might be you know thinking about maybe additional questions beyond uh, the findings and trying to complete uh, the picture because for me there's still some holes. Um, so, when I think about um, sustainable funds or sustainable institutions, um, you know, we basically have, you know, the universe of institutions and we have some kind of a subset of them and the literature views them as a subset of all those institutions that are ESG. You know, they think about ESG and they attract people, they attract investors that like ESG. Within the, these institutions, there's a lot of literature about institutions in general, right, which would include pension funds, mutual funds, insurance companies, we have a subset. These are the mutual funds. And so this paper, as, as well as the previous papers you know, in that line, literature basically focus on 
mutual funds. And they say, well, do we see ESG in mutual funds? That's actually an interesting question, but it's, it also sheds light on, you know, should we see it here versus see it elsewhere, right? Um, why don't we see it here and we see it elsewhere? These are questions that I think are important um, um, to, to examine and to understand. Um, within those mutual funds, we might have a subset of mutual funds who are interested in sustainability. Um, in this paper, we sort of don't really sort them out. Uh, I think next, uh, tomorrow, we have uh, Michelle Laurie, who's going to do some, to try to do some, some more sorting of that. Uh, and maybe, you know, some of her uh, methodology, you know, can be used here. But basically, we say, well, let's look at them in general. And basically, the sorting is basically, what was your ranking? And, uh, you know, how do you uh, react to that? And maybe there's really no mutual fund that, has, that is in interested in, in sustainability. It's all about fads and, and the main idea is just maximizing returns. So this is, you know, this is something I'm quibbling uh, with. You know, what is a uh, strong ESG, not strong ESG uh, mutual fund? Can we di differentiate among mutual funds? And would the results differ, you know, if we have some sustainable funds and others that are not sustainable funds? So, um, ESG investing, uh, it's a preference by a subset of institutions. So this paper focuses on the aggregate preferences of ESG on a subset of institutions, those mutual funds, and the conclusion transitory effect, it doesn't really affect um, uh, in the long run. Uh, and so um, the heterogeneity in this paper in mutual fund with respect to ESG preferences is the globe rating itself. Um, and this seems to be uh, transitory. Um, and so what I'd like to know, one thing, is why does a change in equilibrium driven by low global rating is not reversed? In other words, why did it happen in the beginning? Why does it happen um, afterwards? What really drives the initial effect that is not uh, driving um, effect afterwards? And here, I'm not sure I'm very convinced about the story, um, the story itself. Um, is it really um, investor attention? You know, in the beginning, you know, everybody's, there's attention. That's why we see flow, but then later on, we don't see flow and therefore we don't do it. So everything is really driven about with flow, which I think is sort of what the um, authors are trying to say. Um, um, is it maybe some hype? Maybe it was totally wrong, you know, they just, uh, you know, thought it, it, it's a good idea in the beginning, but ended up really not affecting anybody. Um, and, uh, and this is, I, I think, is, has consequences beyond ESG. So there's additional literature that looks at anything that is, any rating that is given out there for the first time has some kind of a initial consequences uh, in corporate governance. We know a lot about it, and we've seen things like that, how firms react to that, and how investors react to that. And that's, uh, and people have looked at also transitory versus long-term effect. It's interesting to contrast that with what we find here. Um, the second thing is sort of uh, what I mentioned before, you know, this heterogeneity across funds. Uh, one heterogeneity that we know in the literature that uh, affects firms, uh, affects funds' uh, interest in ESG is the relation to long-term versus short-term, right? If I'm a short-term fund, you know, I buy, I sell, you know, I cannot really think, and I don't care maybe about, uh, about uh, the ESG, and what I care about is performance, and what investors care about for my fund is performance. And indeed, you know, in, um, tomorrow we're going to see that, you know, the um, fund long-term versus short-term does have an effect on um, ESG interest. So it would be interesting to see if on a subset of your sample we do indeed see some persistence um, going on. Um, so to conclude, I think it's well-executed, interesting findings, new insight into the effect of Morningstar Global Rating on mutual fund behavior. Pouring some cold water, short-term effect does not hold in the long run. Um, and the argument, it makes sense given that the incentives of fund managers are driven by fund performance. And my main comments, you know, try to figure out what drives the initial effect and also think about the heterogeneity in mutual fund and are they indeed, at least a subset of them, is still interested in doing some, uh, in having um, um, ESG. Um, and also differences between mutual fund and other institutions. Why would we see perhaps pension funds doing it and mutual fund not doing it? You mentioned the incentive effect, but I would argue that the incentive effect would also exist in other, um, in other funds beyond, uh, beyond mutual funds. And so I think more discussion is required here. Thank you very much. Thank you.